Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Susan Solomon, Chief Executive Officer of the New York Stem Cell Foundation. Susan co-founded the New York Stem Cell Foundation in 2005 with a mission to accelerate cures for the major diseases of our time through stem cell research. Susan has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Susan, for joining us today. Delighted to be here. Stem cell research and the genetic research that attaches to stem cell research has really changed medical science for us, and it holds such great promise. Talk about the impetus that resulted in your founding this organization in 2005. Happy to. Um, basically, it was frustration. I saw this incredible uh, paradigm and opportunity really to have a uh, window into a living human being We've never had that before. And uh, the traditional institutions were moving very, very slowly. Part of it was political. Uh, the environment was um, particularly toxic uh, to stem cell research at the time. And also, uh, developing a new field is difficult. And any new field is going to take time to develop. What I saw when we started actually having the conversation uh, with thought leaders, patient advocates, um, people like myself, uh, which is really everyone who's been touched by disease, right. uh, you know, either ourselves or, uh, or people that we love or, or work with. And it doesn't matter if it's Alzheimer's or ALS or AIDS, the, no. the, the research that, that can take a look at genetic material and start to develop approaches, it affects everything. It affects everything, and what we've been able to do with stem cell research and what our particular focus at the New York Stem Cell Foundation uh, is on, particularly in our own laboratory, is basically applying a biological reader to the ACGs and Ts that come from all of the coding. And in Des Describe that, just, just for those of us who... So uh, I think you know everyone uh, has been very, very excited about uh, all of the DNA sequencing and so forth. And in the last couple of years, I think um, all too soon, uh, there were headlines saying, you know, uh, all of the money spent on uh, you know sequencing uh, the human genome is is a big waste. What is it actually accomplished? In fact, it's a little bit like the blind man and the elephant. Um, it is an important part of the picture, but it, it wasn't the entire picture. And so unless you were in a, a tragic situation where you had a, uh, a single variant uh, determining uh, disease like Huntington's, uh, so forth, basically what your genetic information will give you is a set of probabilities, uh, statistics. And for those of us who want to know not just do I have a higher likelihood of getting a particular disease, which in many cases uh, is, is frightening, but it doesn't actually give you information you can act on. Uh, you can make lifestyle changes, but um, you know, for something like uh, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, that really is not going to be sufficient. Um, what we're able to do with stem cell research is integrate, fuse the biology with the genetics. That is the extraordinary opportunity. Uh, but there were tremendous limitations to doing that. Uh, when we began in 2005, the first limitation was who was actually going to do the work. Um, the field, uh, Paul Nurse, uh, who was then uh, president of Rockefeller, uh, Sir Paul Nurse, now heads up the Royal Society in London, he said to me, people did not understand that we've lost an entire generation uh, because of the chilling effect of both the politics and then the ensuing federal policies, the lack of NIH funding. So there you are, you're finishing up your PhD, you want to uh, really define your research program, you have a boatload of loans, typically, for your education, there are no jobs, no funding, and personal insecurity. So your mentor, probably at the time, said, go be a geneticist, or how about neuroscience, but just anything but stem cell research. And so we took a look at that and we said, we have to very quickly build a pipeline. Um, the number of stem cell researchers uh, in the country who were actually doing human stem cell research work when we began uh, would, would fill a small room. Uh, that was it. And it's a young person's field because in most cases, although there are some very established researchers who did switch their work from uh, uh, mouse work uh, primarily, um, you know, or rodents uh, of other types to human cells, uh, you know, they're already established. They have their um, uh, grant, uh, you know, structure and so forth. 
So to get young people into the field, we said what we have to do is uh, make it so attractive that they just can't turn it down and we have to do it quickly. So we get critical mass. And we did that and we established uh, first a postdoc fellowship program um, which we fund, and then uh, an early career investigator program. And we now have uh, well over 70 researchers around the world that we support. So in many um, respects, what you, the, the response to this logjam that resulted in, in dialogue and a lot of blah, blah, and nothing more, the response was to create an immunization strategy in which you, you start to the process of immunizing the research from the vagaries of the politics. Yes, well, and actually, um, that's very well put because what we saw we had to do as a, uh, a second uh, principal activity was to create a safe haven laboratory, a laboratory where you could check the politics at the door, not worry about having to keep a kosher kitchen, if you will, and not mix your federally funded microscope um, with your human uh, embryonic stem cell work. You could actually move ahead as quickly as the science would allow you to. So we started uh, with a 500 square foot laboratory. Um, we now have uh, what I'm told is, uh, is the largest stem cell research laboratory in this country. Um, we have over 45 full-time researchers. 500 square feet is not a lot. <laughs> it's, no. It's, it's no. 20 by, by 25. Right, I mean, exactly. It's, not, it, it's, it's, it's a room. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's a small room. And actually, we began it um, in response to a completely deadlocked experiment uh, Harvard and Columbia wanted to move forward with uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer, cloning, uh, in order to create uh, replacement cells um, for someone with type 1 diabetes so that you could, in effect, um, provide the insulin producing cells that the body had destroyed because of the autoimmune attack. So um, neither Harvard nor Columbia, because of both uh, state policies and also the, um, the risk profiles uh, of those institutions, was willing, quite understandably, to risk the possibility that all of the federal funding for the entire university would be suspended. Would be suspended. Uh, that's a disaster. So we looked at this. We said it's extraordinarily important research. And um, in order to do it, uh, the principal investigator, Doug Melton, at uh, uh, at Harvard and uh, uh, Robin Goland and Rudy Libel at Columbia said, well, we need to have a privately funded laboratory. So we began with that and 500 square feet was enough to do it. Um, we now have uh, a large floor in a, uh, 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 we have a large floor in a biotech uh, incubator building and, um, and we have 45 of our own full-time uh, employees at the New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute. But we saw that that wasn't enough. Um, what we needed to do was to actually take a look at how stem cells were being made. And if we were right, and we thought that these incredible cells were going to be the answer both for cell replacement in the cases where you have cells that are diseased or, right. or lost by injury uh, or otherwise, or in order to be able to find out um, why somebody is getting sick using a human disease model, uh, these living cells that we could now make, and also see if we could develop better drugs and treatments. So if we were going to do that, we simply had to move beyond an academic scale. And a stem cell takes three months to make. That's the biology. You can't change that. But you, what you can change is the number of stem cells that right. are made at one time. You can create a parallel thread that allows you to take that three months, and if you just say three months and you multiply it by the number of lines that you're growing, you all of a sudden can, can create greater yields within the same compressed time frame. That's right. And so um, we thought the way to do that is not to have uh, huge numbers of people working independently at their bench uh, you know, with their hands, uh, very extremely um, expensive, well-trained, very smart people doing work, which is quite tedious mm -hmm. and takes a half a day to do. And you have to do it seven days a week. It's like having a puppy. You cannot go away on the weekends and leave your puppy in, uh, in your home or your apartment. Uh, you have to be there every day for these living cells. And when you have very, very smart people who are doing something that is inherently tedious. The other thing that happens is they tend to get creative with the protocols. So one of the things that we saw is that um, if we were right and, uh, and stem cell research 
was going to be this critical paradigm shift. We were going to have to be able to make identical cells in very large quantity that represented all of the different genetic subtypes of the human population. And you simply cannot do that by hand. Um, making a stem cell by hand takes three months because of the biology. If you are extremely adept and highly trained, you can maybe manage two six-well plates. That means you'll have, at the end of three months, you'll have 12 stem cell lines. That is not a lot. So we decided to embark on something that um, we were uh, told was a holy grail, but we really were never going to be able to do it, um, and that was to uh, create robotics and automate the entire process of creating stem cells and also differentiating stem cells into particular cell types. Um, it took us a lot more than we thought it would. Uh, we were very fortunate uh, that uh, some people um, were willing to support that and said, well, this is very high risk but uh, has a very high return. And uh, so we now have a fully automated system, actually it's a series of systems, so that we can produce, um, uh, we can start several hundred stem cell uh, lines every week and they are identical and any differences in the lines or the cells uh, that we create from those lines is because of an intrinsic difference in the biological material, not because uh, one pair of hands was uh, manipulating the pipette differently than another set of hands. But what it has also done is give us an extraordinary opportunity to really look at the effect of human genetics on um, treatments, on symptoms, and, uh, and really be able to explore a whole new world. So you end up running this organization that is intended as the focal point of stem cell uh, research in a way to cut through the regulatory restrictions, the government restrictions on the liberty to research. How do you get to this point where you become the scissors to cut through red tape and regulation and restriction and uh, uh, government intent to, to tie your hands? How do you get to, to, to this position? Well, it's really interesting. Um, I think when, when you have a field that is under siege, really challenged, the people who are going to choose to be in it, whether it's myself uh, founding an organization, the scientists who join us to work, um, it's going to be a self-selected group of people. I would say pioneers, very tenacious. Um, you have to be very passionate because uh, there are an awful lot of other things that very smart people can do that are a heck of a lot easier. So somebody says no and you say <laughs> yes. Yes, and they I say think, no <laughs> and you say oh yes. I, I think it, 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 we are a group of people, um, and now a, a large group of people, who are very comfortable uh, following our own kind of collective uh, view of the world where we're open to collaborating. Uh, we really operate very much uh, uh, like Switzerland, if you will. We work with the best ideas and the best people anywhere in the world. And so um, if something, uh, to your point, defies conventional wisdom, we are not phased at all. And we, we are confident enough, uh, I think, in the approach and certainly in the last, uh, we're now in our 10th year, um, you know, in the last years, uh, we've had, you know, 15 top breakthroughs. Uh, this, this past uh, December, I opened the Wall Street Journal. It was, uh, it was close to the very, very end of the year. Uh, we were operating uh, with uh, somewhat of a skeleton staff with vacation schedules. And I see that the Wall Street Journal has named uh, four of the major stem cell advances, and two of them were ours. Um, and you know, we had the very high class problem of uh, then pulling together people to actually communicate that to, uh, to our database. And it is a very, very exciting um, combination, I think, of, uh, of passion, um, commitment, really, really hard work, and brains. So talk about the, some of these breakthroughs that, that you uh, feel most proud about? Um, well, the one that we have that is clinic ready, actually, is um, a, uh, a solution um, for people who carry a terrible disease called uh, mitochondrial disease. It's transmitted by the mother, 
and it is something that is uh, not possible to detect um, through the uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis uh, method because the disease is not present in every single cell. Uh, it's really kind of a, a mosaic effect. And the mitochondria are the, uh, the energy cells, the battery pack around the DNA. And so we were able, um, working with the very first technique that we began in our laboratory, somatic cell nuclear transfer, uh, the Dolly the Sheep cloning technique, mm -hmm. we were able to use this technique to create mitochondrial replacement therapy. And that is a way for mothers who carry that terrible disease to ensure that they will have healthy children uh, without the disease and that that disease will not be passed down uh, to the children of, of those children. And it's been approved in the UK and in fact uh, Parliament uh, just you know gave it a full green light. Um, the FDA uh, still wants to uh, spend a little more time on it, but we're very excited that it's, uh, it's moving ahead. Absent that treatment, what type of a life do children have who um, have to live with this disease? Um, it's, it's a range depending on the severity, uh, but profound neurological um, disorders. So ranging from uh, um, you know, deafness, uh, severe movement disorders, um, in many cases uh, they, they don't live uh, very long. And with this treatment? It's, they don't have the disease. They're totally disease free. And, uh, and then they go on and they have their children and that disease is removed from the family 100%. In terms of, of the way forward for uh, the organization, the New York Stem Cell Foundation is not going to stay static. You've invested in an incubated capacity to conduct this research. What does the future hold? So we'd like to continue to um, expand in the area of uh, genetic diversity so that right now, we have um, about 1,600 uh, pieces of biological material representing that number of people. Um, once we get into the several thousand, then we should be able to represent uh, in our uh, array about 95% of the human population. And how incredible it would be if we know in advance what kind of a treatment will work for a particular person, what kind of a treatment or a drug based will, on their genetic makeup based on the based on the biological reading of their genetic makeup and the interplay of uh, their biology and their genetics so we're talking the next step of personalized medicine this is personalized medicine and it's personalized medicine on a mass scale uh, you know this is Pottery Barn, it's not your bespoke tailor. Right. And it's because of the array that we developed and the computing power, uh, the, the confluence of, of factors that is going to allow us to basically divide human beings into um, different genetic uh, shoe sizes, if you will, different genetic buckets. We're different, but we're not all that different. If we have about 2,500 different buckets, we can probably hit 95% of the world population. Um, to get closer to 100%, it's about 25,000. That would seem totally unwieldy in the past, but now with computing power um, and with the ability to manipulate the biology uh, robotically, it's totally achievable. And then out of this comes incubated um, intellectual, intellectually based industries That's that right. are of dramatic a utility for for us all wealthy impoverished young old people who have different genetic makeups of different races and traditions uh, health is something that we all have in common and this is this holds tremendous promise for improving the quality of life of of the human race and also freeing up um, resources to deal with some of the other enormous problems that we face as a population. Um, so if we could develop uh, much more cost-effective, um, more efficacious treatments and drugs in a much shorter period of time, so if we're not looking at between a billion and four billion sunk costs to develop a drug that has a 99% uh, chance of failing, but if we could find out in a dish within three years 
um, how to stratify our clinical trials based on human cells before we even go into the population. Well, not to, not to mention that, that drug testing all, uh, suddenly changes when you can actually look at, at response on a cellular level as opposed to um, putting animals through suffering in service to alleviation of our suffering. Right, that, with, a, with a lousy probative, with uh, a lousy probative uh, conversion and, rate. And with, uh, with increases of pain and suffering um, of, of fellow beings on, That's this, right. uh, on this planet. That's right. Susan Solomon, this is so incredibly informative. The work is so important. Thank you so much for sharing the experience of the New York Stem Cell Foundation. And thank you so much for your insights. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about our work. Thanks.